Okay. Uh, okay, good uh, we have Dr. Ned Thompson from Lanford University and Professor Nana Nidhiyatta from the University of Indonesia and Dr. Nina Wisman from Manila University and uh, last but not least Dr. Chris Manning from Australia National University. Uh, I would like to give the first floor to uh, Nina Wisman because she has to leave uh, earlier due to other uh, prior engagement. So I would like to give each speaker uh, about 10, uh, 10 minutes maximum uh, to present their views. Please, Ibunina. Professors uh, and honorable guests, thank you very much for the honor that uh, of the dozens of writers in the book, I am invited to uh, share what uh, I have written together with Faisal Basri and uh, Karol Ayatuga. So uh, my discussion, if we try to link it with the uh, earlier discussion about the deepening of the Indonesian financial sector, we have discussed about the ideal, right, to improve the value of uh, Mutia and then injecting some kind of exchange in the real sector. But part of it, there's a reminder of the state of livelihood and achievement of most uh, Indonesian people that is still behind the neighbors uh, and the Asian countries in general. We discuss often about demographic dividends, how lucky Indonesia to have big population, but that to assume that we already have competitive, skillful, uh, given sufficient level of education, math, science, reading, etc., to our children. Healthy population that have developed their brain enough, they're not stunted, and then supported to take risks to be creative in economic activities due to the availability of social security programs. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we decided to title our chapter, which is the latest chapter in the book. Usually in a big book like this, you read the first and the end. <laughs> Hopefully you get to read my end, uh, my, my part of the chapter. We choose the title Ambitious but Inadequate. That uh, is our conclusion about uh, SBY's, uh, Chris David Domino's uh, approach to social welfare. Uh, when President Yudo became president, the growth of the economy was uh, quite good actually, 4.3%. The global economy in general was strong, and international donors at that time were keen to support Indonesian reform uh, agendas. And these were supposedly propitious uh, circumstances for both reforms aimed at improving the social welfare of the Indonesian So uh, these are examples of uh, Yudoyono's uh, commitments to uh, social welfare. And so it's said, right? In Bali, 2012, and then we've heard also he uh, repeated the three pillars of socioeconomic development since the very beginning of his tenure, economic growth, crop growth, poverty reduction, and then by 2007 he ended uh, the term environmental protection. Uh, he nevertheless inherited legislative frameworks to improve the sector. The constitution, for instance, mandated more attention to education as well as to uh, the poor people uh, and, uh, and also the social security programs. So uh, he also inherited law number 40, 2004, on national social security reform, and law number 20, 2003, on the national education system. So our chapter focuses on the approaches and programs that uh, Yudhoyono took. How did he advance the goals that he set his commitment to? Did he set the targets? What was his strategy? Did he meet the targets? And he specifically chose health, education, and social assistance um, to focus on. And our conclusion is that the outcomes is uh, falling short of expectation. And uh, because he failed to uh, respond to three sets of challenges that he never managed to resolve satisfactorily. The first set of challenge is reconciling competing demands of the budget of massive subsidies and on expanding numbers of poverty allocation programs. So the first one is to reconcile subsidy versus social welfare uh, money. So because the question is, if you want to improve social welfare, where do money come from, right? That's always the question. And uh, in the chapter, oops, sorry, what happened? In the chapter, you can actually see uh, table uh, 17 one, where we juxtapose uh, as a percentage of GDP 
the uh, state budget over time. And we can see that there is not significant change actually uh, for spending on health, uh, social protection, or education. Uh, but the part on uh, subsidy uh, and energy subsidy is growing quite significantly from around 1.7% to uh, by the latest time we believe, oh, well, almost the latest time we believe, it was about 3.72%. So it was quite high. He, cut, he did cut energy subsidy three times uh, as a means of compensation to the poor. He, oh, sorry. he provided unconditional cash transfers. And um, but the problem here is that he created pressure um, to the state budget. Uh, because he didn't realize that rupiah will always have a cycle of depreciation. And uh, by, by doing this kind of unconditional cash transfer, he actually limits the government ability to counter global shocks. And by the end of uh, his tenure, he actually did cut the state budget dramatically, uh, 100 trillion, trillion rupiah. And that includes significant cuts from the ministry that matters in social welfare. The challenge number two uh, that he failed to counter is that he failed to lay down coherent strategic plan for social welfare and implementing it across Indonesia's many competing ministries and agencies. And by that, he actually tried to create a grand framework, such as um, MP3A, uh, MP3, EI and KI, uh, but he failed to overcome the basic lack of coordination across ministries. And the very first example we can cite on this is on data, because if you target uh, the poor to get uh, to receive unconditional cash transfer, for instance, but you uh, your data on citizens are fully organized, then uh, the state budget is also limited. Then the program will be less. Uh, effective. And uh, data, including from Bakkerman, show that um, money spread thinly and evenly across provinces in Indonesia. Areas who need it most actually didn't get any penny. So um, these are some examples. And then if we compare this across the region, it's actually quite tiny. Indonesia is the one with the red. You can read that maybe later on. And then uh, this is just examples of uh, on the education side that the skill performance of Indonesian age 15 is actually decreasing over time. We did quadratic um, analysis uh, of the data of students from PISA, uh, <coughs> PISA data, and it shows that Indonesia is experiencing very uh, low. I cannot quite see from here. Uh, low uh, number, even compared to our neighbors like uh, like Thailand. So if we imagine ourselves competing to that neighbor, uh, we are left behind. So with the national exam uh, as policy, still there is a de de deceleration in mathematic performance, reading, and such. These are some examples. Uh, some of these chapters, I mean, some of these tables cannot go into the book because of page limitation, but uh, you can always contact me if you want to. And then uh, on the other side, of course, there's enrollment rate increase. Uh, you see the numbers, but we did statistical test on that as well, and we suggest that the quadratic growth rates in this area of SBY did not differ from those preceding year since 1980 until 2002, which means that it's because of the trend that's already going up anyway. So he didn't do much to make this uh, enrollment improving. <laughs> the third challenge that uh, President Yudhoyono failed to uh, do is managing social welfare policy within the framework of decentralization. Uh, among the policymakers, there is repeated confusion about policy making, budgeting, and implementation. What should be the task of the central government, and what the government, the local government, must chip in? Where and how much? So uh, I gave the example in the book about the NPM, for instance, <laughs> about Muslim Bank, about uh, social assistance that is interpreted mostly as donation rather than investment uh, that's carefully planned as part of improvement of long-term improvement of Indonesian uh, citizens' uh, livelihood. 
this is what I mentioned earlier. Indonesia would have been really uh, successful in uh, not only in economy but also in social welfare. But we failed in this because if you check the data on villages, for instance, still 80% of villages doesn't have access to physician. There is serious inequality to specialist physicians. Some province only have one uh, specialist, <clears throat> uh, even. Problems of recruitment and retention of midwives still happen, and it's very serious in rural and remote areas. Maternal mortality is still higher than the rate for Asia as a whole. The World Bank in 2009 even suggested that there is a downward number, but in reality, the progress in ending maternal mortality is stagnating. <clears throat> the part that uh, troubles me most is that the problem of stunting is really bad in some parts of Indonesia. And if you imagine what happened to stunted people, it's not just their height, right, that's lacking, but it's also their brain. So we're losing, potentially, a generation that whatever we do, whatever we do uh, in, the, in the economy, even if it's improving, they cannot take part in it. They cannot make use of the access that we provide simply because their brain was not adequately developed. Uh, so 37.2%, that's the average uh, percent of uh, stunting. And in some areas like Southern Nara Timor, the number is actually reaching 50%. So almost uh, one in two children is stunted. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, um, that's my brief uh, insight of what we have written. Uh, we decided that uh, the, the idea is very good. What SBY tried to do is quite ambitious, but given the time, given resources, he could have done much more. And unfortunately, he didn't tackle the three, any of the three, which could actually be uh, very helpful to any progress that should be done now by the subsequent president. Thank you very much for the time.